Hello, I recently did a video which was a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to make a side opening cloak. And so for today, I wanted to explore more about the history of the side opening cloak. But before we get started, please make sure to select thumbs up if you like this video. If you have questions during the video, please post them in the comments below. And as always, please click subscribe to be updated when new videos come out. And now on to today's discussion. Welcome to today's discussion on historical side opening cloaks. As you can see on the picture here, this cloak opens up on the right side rather than in the front. And I'm guessing, and you will see more examples as we go on of the side opening cloaks, they all opened on the right side. And I'm guessing that this has to do with where the placement of the sword was and how you got onto your horse. For example, most people are right-handed. So you would put your sword on your left hip. That way, when you go to draw your sword, your right hand would grab the sword off of your left hip and then be able to grab the sword and then start fighting. Well, if you have the sword on your left hip, that is why we get on horses from the left side. That way, the sword is not getting in the way while you put your left foot up in the stirrup and then hop onto the horse. Because if your sword was on the right side, on your right hip, and then you're trying to then get on the horse, the sword is just going to get in the way and it's going to make it difficult to get on the horse. So you've got your sword on your left side and you're getting on the horse just the same. It makes sense to have the cloak opening on your right side rather than your left. Because say your cloak went down to your knees or went down to your ankles and then you're trying to get onto a horse, it's a lot easier to not have any fabric there and get up on your horse rather than having a whole bunch of fabric right there and then trying to bundle it all up to then get onto your horse. Also, if you think about it as far as your sword and being on your horse, the sword placement, if your cloak opens from the right side, you can grab your left arm, Fling back the cloak up over your left shoulder and then your right arm is free to draw your sword. And because if you had a cloak that was say knee length or ankle length, depending on how you had your sword placed on your hip, someone who is coming at you may or may not know that you're carrying a sword or what type of sword you're carrying. So that could be easily concealed by the cloak opening on your right side and then hiding the sword on your left. So where did this style of cloak come from? Based on my research, I'm guessing that the original side opening cloak can um, be dated back to the Greeks. If you look at this picture on the left side, it is the Greek, if I mispronounce this, I'm sorry, please correct me, Lamis. It was a rectangular cloak that fastened on the shoulder. It was worn by men, and not women, just men, who were soldiers, travelers, hunters, and it fastened on the right shoulder and was draped over the left shoulder. It was usually made of wool, at least for what I found from research purposes, all we can find is that it was made from wool. And the dimensions of this type of cloak was approximately six to seven feet long and about three and a half feet wide. So just imagine a very long, and like I said, six to seven feet long piece of fabric that's rectangular, three and a half feet wide, drape it over your left shoulder, and then clasp it on the right, um, on the right shoulder, which you'll find this is similar to the Roman cloak. So here are examples, or more examples of what you would find with Greek and Roman cloaks, again, pinned on the right shoulder and draped over the left shoulder. And so into the Roman cloaks. Roman cloaks were known as, if I mispronounced this, I'm sorry, the sagum. It was also rectangular in shape. It closed on the right shoulder with a fibula and it was draped over the left shoulder. For soldiers, it was a cloak that they would wear during the day. And then when they unpinned it, it's a rectangular shape. They could use it as a blanket at night. They typically left the sheep oils in the wool 
So it made it kind of smelly, but that way it made it waterproof. And on the left side here of the page, here is a statue, and you can see where two soldiers have the sagum pinned together on the right shoulder. It's being draped over the left shoulder. And then there's also a drawing to give you more of a, an idea of exactly what this type of cloak looked like. So it opened on the right side and was draped over the left shoulder. And if you needed your left arm, all you had to do was take the front flap and throw it up and over your left shoulder. And then it just hung on your backside with both arms free. And this Greek and Roman rectangular cloak fed its way into more medieval type cloaks. For example, here is a Viking side opening cloak. They also closed on the right shoulder. They were typically closed with a pin such as a penannular brooch. They were also typically made from wool. They may have been made from linen, but due to limited research possibilities, we know that they were made from wool. Typically, they were knee to ankle length. That partly depended on your wealth. And it was also made of a rectangular piece of fabric. And for those who were not Viking, but still existed in the medieval time period, the side opening cloaks were worn by men, again, closed on the right shoulder. And instead of having a pin, a lot of times they would have buttons and they could have anywhere from from what I found with statues and paintings, I found that they had anywhere from one to eight buttons on their shoulder. I think part of that just depended on the size of the button. The larger the button, well, the fewer the buttons you had, just because there's only so much space between where your neck ends and the shoulder seam begins. So depending on the size of your shoulder, you might be able to get, say, three or four buttons in there if you had smaller buttons. Or if you decided to go past the shoulder seam and go down your arm some, that is where you find where they had up to eight buttons, but that's because the seam was going down part of the arm. But we'll get more into that in a minute. These cloaks were also usually made from wool, but as we get into the later centuries, they were also made from linen, or depending on your wealth, could have been made from silk or velvet. They were typically hip to ankle length. I think part of that also depended on your status and also what century we're in because the earlier centuries you'll find they're longer but then as we get into the later centuries they get shorter. The difference is the medieval side opening cloaks are rounded rather than rectangular because remember so far with the Greeks, the Romans, the Vikings we've had rectangular shapes just draped over the left shoulder and pinned on the right. Now you'll start to find these cloaks um, start to round themselves out and they become, think of a half circle with a hole cut out for the neck hole. And here are some examples of 13th century cloaks. This is from the Crusader Bible. It was done in France roughly about 1244 to 1254. And as you can see, all of these different pictures show, we'll say ankle to mid-calf length cloaks and all clasped on the right shoulder. And it looks like it's just one button holding it in. It may have been a pin, but because some of them, you can't see if there's a pin or a button. The one that is the fourth one over from the left, that one clearly is a button, but the others you don't see anything. So it may have been a pin. But either way, either one pin, one button. Then we get into the Boxton Bogman cloak. The Boxton Bogman I find to be interesting. He died in a peat bog in the 14th century in Sweden. From, well, because he was killed and his body left in a peat bog, he has been very well preserved. His body was discovered in 1936. And he still had his hair. He still had his clothing. Some pieces had disappeared, probably just evaporated in the peat, like some of the linen. But a lot of the wool 
remained, and so we have a really good idea of what he was wearing when he died. We also know that he was hit on the head three times and then impaled with three wooden poles, probably to prevent his body from rising in the peat bog. But depending on which historian and which research you want to believe, he may have been hit on the head three times and then impaled with three poles, or over the centuries, this may have happened just with, I believe the research said that it was roofing that had been put in place and then they later found his body. And so just with modern buildings being built, well, he may have been accidentally impaled by modern construction rather than having died by being hit in the head three times. But with his body, he still had a wool tunic, a wool cloak, a hood. Although the Holland Cultural Histor History Museum, it, they list it as an ostrich hood. But when you look at it, to me, it looks like a pipe hood. So think of a form-fitting hood, but with that long tail on the back of the hood that drapes down. And if it's long enough, you can stick part of it in your belt. He also had woolen hose and leather shoes. The cloak he was wearing is semicircular. It had the neck opening on the right side. And because he was so well preserved, we actually know the dimensions of his cloak. It was 110 centimeters long, 380 centimeters wide, and had a neck circumference of 76 centimeters. And on the right side is a drawing of what the cloak looked like when it was found. As you can see, it's shaped in pieces. So you have the main piece of fabric, and then the bottom half of the circle was sewn with another piece of fabric, and then a little chunk was added to it, and then little bits at the end. And here is actually what he was wearing when his body was found. On the right side is the cloak itself, and then on the left side is the the cloak as well as the other items he was wearing so you can see the lear pipe hood you can see his tunic you can see his leggings this i find interesting just because up into this period the cloaks had been rectangular and as you can see this is not quite a semi well not quite half a circle but it's semi-circular when you, it's Fold it up, but when you lay it out flat, it is half a circle. And here are some examples of side opening cloaks from the 14th century. On the left is the effigy of William of Windsor, and he died in 1348. Part of what I find interesting with this effigy is he is made to look like a man. However, it's a small man because this effigy is only 20 inches long. He died at the age of two months. If I remember correctly, he was born in June and died in September before his third month birthday or before he turned three months. But his effigy still shows him, my guess is showing him as the man that he may have become had he lived. But as you can see, He's wearing a side opening cloak. It is flipped up and over the left shoulder to expose the clothing underneath, but you can see the buttons going down on the shoulder and it appears to be four buttons going down. On the right hand side of the screen is Lionel of Antwerp. He was Duke of Clarence and he died in 1368. He can be found at Westminster Abbey. And again, you can see the side opening cloak opening from the right side, buttons down the right shoulder, with the cloak flipped up and over the left shoulder, so that way you can see his clothing underneath with his tunic and his leggings. And more examples from the 14th century. This is where the side opening cloak seems to have been the most popular, at least as far as examples that can be found from either paintings or statues or sculptures, pick something. On the left-hand side is from 1377. It is at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. And as you can see, he actually has a short cloak. 
you could call it a cape because of how short it is. It goes below the hips, but it's above the knees. And this one is dagged along the hem, all along the hem of the cloak. And it looks like he only has one button, but again, it's on the right shoulder and it's pulled back a little bit so you can have a glimpse of his tunic as well as his leggings. And on the right side of the screen is Johann von Holzhausen. He died in 1393 in Frankfurt, Germany. And again, side opening cloak, opening on the right side, buttons down the shoulder, and it's pulled back a little bit to expose his tunic and leggings underneath. However, this cloak is interesting because if you notice, he has eight buttons going down the right shoulder. So obviously it's going past the right shoulder and partly down his arm. It's above the elbow, but more fabric was used to make his cloak. And now we go into the 15th century. On the left-hand side is Sir John Casey. He died in 1400, so just barely the 15th century. Considered to be the very last of the 14th century. But I have included the original picture, but also a drawing that was found of him, of that original picture, just because of how difficult it is to make out the details. But you can see, in, at least in the drawing, that it is a side opening cloak. It opens up on the right side, buttons down the shoulder, and then it is draped up and over the, the left shoulder to expose what he's wearing underneath. And then on the right side, Again, side opening cloak, buttons down the right shoulder, and the cloak being draped up and over the left shoulder. And more examples from the 15th century. On the left side is a picture, it's from the North Wind. On the right side is William Chichel. He died in 1426. Same thing as before for both of these. Opening up on the right side, buttons down the right shoulder, and then having the cloak being able to go up and over the left shoulder to expose the clothing underneath. And more examples from the 15th century. On the left-hand side is John Martin. He died in 1436 in Kent, England. And again, opens up on the right side, buttons down the shoulder, and you can catch a glimpse of the clothing underneath. On the right side is a zoomed-in picture. It's from the scenes of the life of St. Ulrich. It is from 1455, and you can see the gentleman on the left and also the gentleman on the right are both wearing side opening cloaks, or you could call them capes because of them, the cloak being shorter. Cloaks tend to be about knee to ankle length, and capes tend to be more about hip length. But again, opens up on the right side buttons down the shoulder, and then can go up and over the left shoulder to expose the clothing underneath. And now we're finally into the 16th century. And by the 16th century, clothing had gone from being just big pieces of fabric that weren't really form-fitting. And now in the 16th century, this is where you start to find clothing, like with women's clothing being stiffened with buckram and glue or with stays such as whalebone or like broom straws and clothing becomes more form-fitting and i think with the clothing becoming more form-fitting there is less of a need of cloaks for people to wear they still had cloaks but the cloaks that they did wear were front opening rather than side opening and I think part of this is because with the form-fitting clothing, they were able to make jackets that fit them. They were able to make coats, doublets, like I said, various layers that they could put on top that were more form-fitting rather than just a loose piece of fabric that buttoned on your shoulder. But for the ones that did wear a cape that was side opening, the ones that I did find were more for, I think, more for show rather than actual use. And that would be Sir Walter Raleigh. This painting is from 1588. And as you can see, he is dressed up in his finery and he has a cloak draped on his left shoulder, I think just to show that 
he has money to buy extra fabric, so he has it just draping over his left shoulder for decoration rather than for warmth purposes. Same thing on the right is Richard Tompkins. This is a painting from 1575. You can see him all decked out in his form-fitting attire, and he has a side-opening cloak, but it's just a cape draped on his shoulder. So who knows, maybe for actual useful purposes, he may have put the cloak around his shoulders and it would have just been front opening, but for the purposes of the picture, just draped it over his left shoulder. Who knows? But to me, these paintings make the cape look more frivolous than of actual use. So if you're curious how to make a side opening cloak, I did do a step-by-step -step tutorial and I will include that link in the description. But if you want an idea of what the pattern looks like, then here it is. The neck hole would be your neck circumference plus a little bit of a seam allowance. And this particular pattern is without a collar. If you want to add a collar to the pattern, then what your measurement is around your neck, so the neck circumference, then that's how much you want for your collar. But again, add a little bit of seam allowance if you're going to add two layers to it or take one long piece of fabric and then fold it up and over to create your collar. If you do add a collar, I would say no more than maybe two to three inches um, tall. Otherwise, if it gets too tall, then you're running into your jawline. The shoulder hem it is the measurement between the neck and the edge of the shoulder. That is the spot where if you look on the pattern, you'll see a circle and then a line before you get to the top edge. That is the shoulder hem. So you'll go from your neck to where you want the edge of the cloak to be. If you want to be right at the top of your shoulder, then that's your measurement. If you want to have it like the one picture, if you remember the eight buttons going down and going down part of the arm, then you want your cloak to be longer. So you'll have that measurement be longer. And then remember this is a half circle. So your radius is the measurement of the side seam and it should be the same measurement as the front open side edge, which will be the same as the measurement of the back open side edge. So as you cut your fabric out, you will take, for example, if you want your neck hole to be 23 inches, and then that's the circumference around, and then seven inches between the neck and the shoulder. And then for the picture that is at the bottom, that is 43 inches for the radius. So that is 43 inches from the shoulder down to the hem. And then when you're cutting out the fabric, you'll just take your you'll just take your yardstick and or your meter stick and then just move it down and around 43 inches from the neck hole to where you want the hem to be. And then just keep moving your yardstick down and that will create that curve. And if you had questions or want to view more websites on the information that has been presented, here is my Works Cited page. And the Works Cited page continued. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Post them in the comments below. Remember to select thumbs up if you like the video. And as always, please subscribe.